being stuck to some wrong model. So generally, it is considered a very sensible approach. Uh, the, the goal of this research is that uh, we want to understand the hazard of this uh, well-established uh, evolution process, in particular when the data generation process is endogenous. Suppose a policymaker is a large player, just like a monetary authority, uh, so that uh, its behavior can influence the data generating process. Uh, so suppose a policymaker, like a Federal Reserve, make a forecast from the different models, and suppose uh, one of them is a correct model. So they use a model averaging, and question is, uh, whether the policymaker can learn the true model if he can access infinitely many number of data and if the decision maker's prior assigns policy probability to the true model. Okay. So that's the question. Uh, what we do is that uh, inspired by the uh, access paper by Evans, Onkapohia, Sargent, and Williams, uh, we construct an example based on the asset pricing model, uh, which has the uh, unique rational expectation equilibrium, which is a linear function of a state variable. Uh, and this coefficient is constant, so that uh, we can describe this model as a constant parameter model. And uh, if this young maker uh, does not know the coefficient, but uh, he has a prior of a uh, class of constant parameter model, then uh, he can learn, he can learn this rational expectation equilibrium uh, through Bayesian updating. Uh, but suppose, the, for some reason, a policymaker take another model, let's say uh, this uh, correctly specified model for some reason cannot explain the volatility of price. So he chose another class of model, let's say time very parameter model, and take an average to form a forecast. Just uh, in such a case, uh, there is a well defined, there is some sense that the time very parameter model is misspecified. And uh, the policymaker updates the weight between the correctly specified model and misspecified model to form a forecast. Okay, so that's kind of a basic description of the behavior of our model. Okay. And the result is we show that uh, even though even though a policymaker can assign possible weights of correctly specified model, eventually the correctly specified model is replaced by the misspecified model. Is a probability one. Okay. So I think that's what the title says. So, in a certain sense, bad model drive out of good model. Uh, in this sense, uh, in a certain sense, our results are formalized and strengthen the observations by these four people. So, if you have any questions, I will reflect the questions to <laughs> <laughs> three of these. So, uh, so by, by now, you may think, what's wrong with this grain of truth assumption? Because uh, I, I already gave some impression that the decision maker has, some, has assigned prior probability to a correctly specified model. But as he learns through the uh, learn by observing more data and updating his belief about the model through Bayesian updating, in the end, his belief will concentrate on some wrong model. So you have, a, you have, you have reason to ask what, what's going on about this uh, grain of truth assumption. And uh, we will talk about that uh, toward the end of this talk. Okay. Uh, so for now, so let's talk about the uh, example okay, to be more concrete. So this is a very textbook example. So let's think about the following uh, recursive formula. So price, today's price is a function of uh, a ZT, which is a fundamental, like uh, GDP, and uh, expectation of uh, tomorrow's price. Okay. So 
uh, in contrast with uh, Evans, Honka, Pohia, Sergeant Williams, uh, we are using, uh, they, they use the Corbett model where this is a condition on T minus one about current price. So we just use this example to show that their observation can, can be applied to broader class of models. So today's price is determined as a func linear function of uh, fundamentals and uh, expect, uh, expected price of future and uh, the random shock. And let's assume that uh, this uh, real process ZT evolved according to ARL1 process. And uh, epsilon uh, T, epsilon ZT are all Gaussian, uh, standard Gaussian orthogonal to each other, everything else. So in this model, we know there is a unique rational expectation equilibrium, uh, which is uh, given as a PT is a linear function of ZT. And uh, notice that this coefficient is constant. And uh, what it says is uh, volatility of uh, PT over the volatility of ZT must be explained by this uh, small shock, epsilon T. So that's what the textbook says. So throughout this talk, uh, we'll assume that the alpha and rho are between 0 and 1, but they are close to 1. Throughout this talk, whenever I say alpha is like uh, 0.99, rho 0.97, something like that. So suppose uh, agent knows a fundamental process but does not know the structural uh, price equations. Suppose he doesn't know this coefficient. And uh, instead, this uh, decision maker postulates the following uh, st state space models. That is, he assumed that uh, he has uh, some model in his mind. The price it evolves as a function of uh, uh, fundamentals, and uh, coefficient can evolve certain stochastic process. Okay. But suppose, suppose this is what he entertains: sigma v equals zero. Then that means he assumed that the beta is a constant. I just write this way so that I can uh, include time varying parameter model within the same context. So suppose uh, this decision maker assumed that sigma v equals zero. So he assumed that the beta is constant, but not known. So let's think about the class of uh, functional form of this form as M0. Okay? So we can uh, parameterize this M0 uh, by this. Uh, this constraint, sigma v equals zero. And uh, this is a correctly specified model in the sense that this class, class ha contains a rational expectation model, uh, equilibrium. So, suppose uh, he does not, uh, decision maker does not know this uh, coefficient delta over minus alpha rho, but he has a, f a full support prior over, the, over this M zero. And uh, as a Bayesian, uh, he updated the belief about this, uh, this uh, over M0 through B, uh, Bayesian updating scheme. Okay. So under the assumption of Gaussian, the posterior become Gaussian. You know, to keep track of Gaussian, you have to keep track of two numbers. One is a conditional mean and the conditional covariance. So conditional mean is a beta t conditioned on information of the t and the uh, conditional variance is a sigma t. So it's given by the following Kalman filters. Okay. So, so we, under st standard assumption to avoid some uh, uh, simul uh, simultaneity between beliefs and observations, uh, we can show, <coughs> uh, this is what is pretty well known, that uh, this covariance Covariance vanishes at the rate of one over t, and this conditional mean converges to rational expectation equilibrium. So in that sense, uh, if you have a belief which is absolute continuous with respect to truth, then Bayesian updating scheme will lead you to the truth. So this is kind of sense of convergence. And uh, 
As long as alpha rho is less than one, we know this convergence is stable. So if you can, if you just plot it out, it's a, a beta t converged to the uh, ratio expectation uh, value in a fairly predictable way. Okay? So this is just for benchmark. So, so what's the problem of this? Well, uh, we observed for some reason uh, there is a reason why we uh, want to look at some other models. For example, suppose prices are excessively volatile or this volatility comes in some waves, then the, and also econometric, econometricians discover that the parameters are highly non-stationary. It's not stationary. So in response, you have a reason to entertain different class of models. So let's assume that, uh, let's consider different class of models where beta evolves according to uh, random walk with, with uh, innovation terms uh, epsilon v, and uh, this one now has a, a non-degenerate uh, covariance, sigma v. Okay? So this class of model can be parameterized by this assumption, sigma v. Uh, for a moment, uh, let's assume that this decision maker believes in sigma v, and this is not an object he want to learn for a moment. Okay? We can come up with a theory how we, how we optimally decide this sigma v, but for a moment, the sigma v is written on his DNA, so this is not the object of what he, he want to learn. Okay? So suppose he he believed, he entertained this class of models. And just observe that M1 is not correctly specified in the sense that this class of model does not include rational expectation equilibrium. Because in order to be rational expectation equilibrium, sigma v has to be zero. And uh, this M1, which parameterized by, uh, no, characterized by this pair of equations, and the sigma v is some positive, small positive number, does not contain the rational expectation equilibrium. In that sense, we can call M1 is not correctly specified. Okay. I have a question. Whenever you say that you have a prior over sigma v, there is also a prior over the initial sigma <coughs> Let's, okay, <coughs> that's, that's what I'm saying. Suppose, for the sake of conversation, okay, and the sigma v, uh, I know sigma v. Okay, so that's not the object I want to learn. My goal, for the sake of conversation, let's assume that my objective is to learn this coefficient beta for the sake of conversation. So in the paper, we have uh, some story about how we, learn, we can learn sigma v as well. Okay, okay so as a good, uh, good Bayesian, you can learn this beta one, uh, this coefficient using the Bayesian updating and the updating scheme for the uh, uh, conditional mean and the conditional variance is given by same Kalman filters. To observe that, the second equation, uh, if you notice that there is a sigma v square term, so that uh, this uh, conditional variance does not vanish to zero, rather it converged, it is bounded away from zero uniformly. Right? So as a result, this, this term, which is often known as a Kalman gain, is uniformly bounded away from zero. So this is a good comparison. So if you believe M0, and this term vanishes at the rate of one over T, and if you believe sigma v is positive, then this Kalman gain is bounded away from zero. Okay. Well, then the, what's the limit? Well, we can we can we can use the same kind of technique to show the uh, invariant distribution of beta, because beta is a probability distribution over this uh, class of belief, and we know. Uh, there is a stationary distribution of beta which can be approximated by a solution of following uh, stochastic differential equations. 
So evolution of beta is determined, uh, driven by some ordinary differential determining system, also known as associate ordinary differential equation, and some uh, some perturbation term, which is whose size is determined by sigma, which is a kind of monotony function of sigma b. So as long as uh, this person has a small sigma v in his head, his belief about beta in the limit has a non-degenerate distribution. And it is centered around, centered around a stationary point of this ordinary differential equation, which is exactly the rational expectation equilibrium. So in this sense, in this sense, even if you start with the wrong model, you may you have reason to believe in the wrong model. So you believe you believe beta is moving around, and because you believe beta is moving around, you have estimator which is moving around. Because estimator the coefficient is moving around, it generates some volat extra volatility of the price, and because extra volatility of the price. It looks like, so in the limit, yeah, around the stationary point, this term becomes zero. That means evolution of beta looks just like a random walk. So in that sense, his belief that beta evolved according to random walk can be self-confirmed. Although this is not a rational expectation equilibrium. So that's the only basics. But it's right on average. What? But it's still right on average, right? Right on average, yeah. So in that sense, it is kind of a, you have reason to stick to this wrong belief. Okay? Well, but not quite. Not quite. <laughs> the story is getting more interesting. Okay? <laughs> so this policymaker is, uh, is not really commit, does not have this prior, uh, dogmatic prior. So he has uh, some prior about M1, M1 is correct, M0 is correct. Okay? So he has a, he hired a, a forecasting firm that uses M0 model. And he ha also hired a forecasting firm that uses M1 model. And uh, they generate a forecast. I take an average, but as a good Bayesian, I have a prior over this uh, prior over which model is correct, and I update this prior, and I, that I use the posterior as a weight to to form an av uh, average. So this is what they call uh, Bayesian model average. Okay. So let's start with the assumption that the pi zero is a policymakers belief that the M one model is correct. In other words, as long as pi, pi zero is a strict less than one, this policymaker assigns some positive weight to M zero, which we know contains a rational expectation equilibrium. So there's something which I don't understand. So this, the way you can read this is that you have a discrete prior over these two sets. Or you could have alternatively thought that you just include the sigma v equal to zero in m1 and have a prior over m1. If you do the la latter, you learn the model. That was your first example. If you have the positive measure on uh, on the correct data genetic process, you're good. But if you have a discrete prior over these sets. Discrete prior of what? On the two sets. So it, as, 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 so there's a basic interpretation to this, right? It's as if I have, I have a discrete prior over m0 and m1 and I'm like this rule. Yeah. The alternative was that I just put, I'm, I'm still a Bayesian as a policymaker, but I just put uh, the sigma v equal to zero in M1, I augment it, and have a prior over this M1 augmented. Let, let, let's ask why they did this way. George. I don't understand the alternative. You just add the sigma v equal to zero model in M1 and have a prior over this set. I, I think this is equivalent. No, I don't think. 
No, it's, uh, in this case, in this case, uh, he's talking about what if you learn sigma v as well? Yeah, if you learn all this. Yeah. For a moment, let's stick to the story for a moment. This is the kind of framework they did. Okay. So my view is this. So I consider the person who, like an M zero person, as a rational guy and uh, the person who believe in M1 as a kind of crazy guy using game theory language, some, someone else. And uh, this is a particular form of uh, crazy type. And uh, I assume this is a particular crazy type. Fair enough? Okay, so that's the story. So question <coughs> is, this person start with a belief that uh, M0 is correct with positive probability. Okay. And uh, he assigns some positive probability to M1, which is misspecified mis mis in a sense that it includes some variable which should not be there. So this is kind of a different uh, misspecification, slightly different from the usual sense. When, the, when you say model is misspecified, misspecified usually means <laughs> variable which should be there. But in this sense, in this case, you include some variable which should not be there, but the data seems to confirm your belief. Okay. Now the question is, if you observe many data, can you exclude this crazy model? And uh, that's our main exercise. Okay. So let's just uh, formalize the process. So. Based on the, uh, my posterior pi t, I form an average of the two forecast. And based on the two, two forecast, actual uh, price is determined. And uh, from, from zero, M zero people update beta zero according to this process. And uh, from one, M one people update the, the uh, conditional mean according to this. Is that clear? Okay, so, so in a certain sense, there is some sense that there is a grain of truth is there. Okay? So question is, what is the asymptotic properties of pi t, beta t0, and beta t1? So the easy part is to show beta t and beta t1 converge to the rational expectation value in a well-defined sense. Okay. So that's, so central question is, does pi t converge to zero? So because it's, uh, if you believe in pi zero, m zero model, because of this uh, uh, Kalman game vanished at the rate of one over t, this convergence of beta t zero is a probability one sense. And uh, because Kalman game does not vanish when you believe in M1, its convergence is uh, in the sense of weak convergence. So, so now question is, does pi t converge to zero? If pi t converges to one, that means this policy maker end up believing wrong model. Does it have to converge at all? I'll get there. Oh. I'll get there. I, I give you some suspense. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the main result. And this is what we formally proved. Suppose alpha rho. So alpha is kind of a, this a feedback coefficient. How much the your expectation is fed back to current price. So as long as alpha rho is bigger than half, then pi t has a two locally stable point, zero and one. So it ends up part of your equation. It can converge to one. So this is kind of a result that formalized the observation by George and others. So they did a numerical exercise and observed that some sample paths converge to pi per one. 
and you can actually prove pi k has a locally stable point. One becomes a locally stable point. That means, that means policy maker can believe in the wrong model. You have a question? Yeah. Uh, can you, when, when you say convert, in what sense? Is it like almost or convert? Yeah. In what sense? Probably too much. So pi t has to convert, right? It's a Martin. Yep. Pi t has to converge. It's better than Martin Gale, actually. And this convergence is for any sigma mu, not equal, not going to zero, any positive sigma mu? You can show pi k must converge zero or one. No, no, but I'm asking about sigma v. Uh, sigma is sigma positive. V. Sigma, sigma, sigma v. Yeah. For the sake of conversation, for the sake of conversation, the person M1, <coughs> you are talking about M1 people, right? M1 people does not want to know sigma v. So it's a kind of return he, his his head, and the. For the sake of conversation, let's put aside why he want to believe but that way. Is, is it for sigma v strictly greater than zero, or sigma, sigma v strictly greater than five? Or? No, any sigma v uh, bigger than zero. This is result hold. And uh, in fact, the relative value of sigma v is a small positive number. So that's, just give some small positive number sigma v, you have this result. So that means, it is possible correct model can be driven out. Possible. And uh, this is kind of a, a formalization of numerical discovery of Jojen and others. But it's a stronger point. It's not just possible. It's either you, you're going to go one way or the other. And uh, here is the result. And it goes the wrong way. That is, in the long run, as a, for small sigma v, for small sigma v, you will spend almost all the time to the wrong model. So that's the main conclusion of this paper. You are supposed to be depressed. <laughs> <laughs> it's depre it's Why? pessimistic. Why? <laughs> <laughs> So that's the, that's the main result. So let's just look at some numerical simulations. So let me re replicate what you guys did and add some more result. Okay. It, it, we shouldn't be depressed because it, it, your remarks about close to self-confirming should make us pretty happy. Yeah, but the, on the other hand, I start, with a, I start with a belief. Suppose I believe M0 with 90%. And I, I start to observe more and more data. And uh, we know M0 is a correct model, which contains rational expectation equilibrium. Then there is some sense that I should believe, in the end, M0. But it says, uh, for small sigma v, I end up believing M1. But this may have to do with the fact how well the model can approximate the outcome I get under the other belief. Yes, I get yeah. It's also true that the wrong model gets closer and closer to the correct model. What? No, 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 it's not. It's not. If sigma v goes to zero. So, so the exercise is so suppose for sigma, small sigma v. Okay. Even any sigma v. This prop, this pi. Uh, so if you look at the sample pass properties for small, I'll, I'll show you numbers. If you give me small sigma v, the chance that pi t goes to one become very high. That's the way how you be. Small sigma v, even if you're stuck in M1, you're right on average, and the spread is really small. I'll get that. I get that. Okay. So that has some uh, some uh, valid points. So I, I'll address that. You don't know what a random walk with small sigma v looks like. I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, actually, uh, I, I get that. Okay. So that, because there is some uh, observable implication. So. So if you do some simulations, then the, you can see the sample pass of pi start with uh, like a 10%. It's just settled down to zero. There's kind of typical sample pass you might expect. 
So what I did is uh, run many simulations. So I run like uh, uh, 10,000 simulations. Then around 45% of the time, it converged to zero, like this. Usually sample pass has this property. So it converged to zero, but the, do you see some wiggles around here? Okay. And that's very typical. So all the sample pass converged to zero has that properties. But around 45%, it converged to one. And when it converged to one, it just like a, looks like being stuck there around 45%. So what is sigma v here? Sigma v is like uh, 0, 0, 0, 0001. And I'd like to see some random walks for, for that coefficient, because how, how far are we from the, from the true mark? Yes. Yeah. You, you will answer your part of your questions. So your question is a very valid one, because uh, Sigma v 0, 0, 0, 0, 0001 should be very close to sigma v equals zero. So the question is, what's the big difference? So we generate some, this particular figure is designed to answer your question. In other words, for such a sigma v, small sigma v, when you switch the model from M0 to M1, the resulting variant uh, volatility of price can increase by 200%. So see that? And uh, this is kind of a, so I says 45% zero, 45% one, kind of ballpark number. Around 9%, this is what happened. Going to zero, looks like going to zero, then after a certain episode, zoop to one, and stuck there. And notice that when around M0, the coefficient is almost constant, right? But as you move M1, because the coefficient is moving around, however small it might be, there is additional force of volatility. That's why you're asking. And because of that, there are gonna be extra volatility in the price. And that's, this is what you see. This is extra volatility caused by this switching. And depending upon the parameter values, this uh, volatility can increase like uh, 150%. So there's a real difference, even though sigma v is very small. And uh, this is not a consistent. There is something like, it looks like converged to zero. Sorry, going back. And you can see this kind of episode around uh, 9%. So for even smaller value, you can see that. but. Very rarely, very rarely, there's some simple path going from one to zero. What is going on? When you say one to zero, zero to one, you mean close to zero to close to one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is not something you expect, right? It should go zero, so you believe almost you almost got there, yeah? You almost got there. But following certain episode, your pi start kind of a two one. Wait, 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 pi, pi zero is local silver point. Pi equal one is local, local silver point. But at, after certain episode, just. And just notice that this is what's going on. So 45% zero, 45% one, but uh, out of the remaining 10%, nine goes from zero to one. Out of the remaining 10, one goes to from one to zero. So you have some sense that in the long run, this probability is switching from zero to one. That's kind of sense I'm talking about. Okay. And along the way, however small sigma v can be, you can see Real increase of real volatility. So that remark kind of hinted at the order of the limits that you guys take? Yes. So that's the that's a key. So T goes infinite first and the sigma V goes later. So that's kind of sense that the difference between decreasing gain and constant gain. Okay? 
So this is uh, some uh, sim result from simulations for, as a function of sigma v. When sigma v is a point zero 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 five, uh, around the sixty percent of sample pass goes to one. So as you decrease sigma v to zero, you so start to see certain tendency that shows it goes to one. May, of course, when sigma v is very, very, very small, then the two models may, does not make much difference. But interesting part is, for small sigma v, you will see some extra volatility. But the interesting thing is, what is the source of this extra volatility? Here, right? It has nothing to do with the economy. There is somebody who be, happens to believe, happens to believe this uh, coefficient has uh, evolved according to random walk, and data seems, data seems to confirm his belief. And that generates extra volatility. So what is going on? I don't think I have a time to talk about some uh, actual analysis, but uh, let's just briefly mention what it, what's wrong with the grain of truth assumption is. So this is what we assumed. Suppose you force, you force this guy believe, rash, believe rational expectation equilibrium instead of M0, okay? Instead of M0, suppose you have to believe rational expectation value when you believe M0. Okay, so I just uh, anchor the belief to rational expectation equilibrium in M0. That's a much stronger assumption than this. Right? So this is what we assumed. If you believe M0, your coefficient will converge to rational expectation equilibrium in a very stable manner. That's kind of sense we, ha we believe, we assume. And we show that this is not restrictive enough to let the policymaker learn the true model. What you need is this. If you do that, if you do that, it converts to zero, sorry. It converts to zero. <laughs> it converts to zero. So if you anchor your belief to real rational expectation equilibrium, then it converges to zero, but convergence speed can be extremely slow because there are two locally stable points, and uh, it is slow in the sense that the speed can be as slow as moving from one locally stable point to another locally stable point when the perturbation is very small. We know this takes a long time. I uh, have done, uh, we, we haven't done that. Do you have any sense of what that can? No, I, I, I don't think, I, don't think uh, I, I, I have a time constraint. Let Noah talk about that. <laughs> so that's the, that's the conclusion. So 
if I have more time, I can talk about some uh, uh, some analytics. There's some neat stuff here, but uh, let's, let me stop here.